Boa noite, good evening, buenas noches. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome todas, todos, todes tonight for the official launch of Estamos Bien, La Trienal 2021. This exhibition is El Museo del Barrio's first national survey of Latinx contemporary art, and it portrays this very lively scene from the perspective of a research conducted by its three curators, Elia Alba, Susanna Vitemkin, who are also here with us tonight, and myself, Rodrigo Moura, Chief Curator of El Museu. In order to adapt our plans to the reality imposed by the coronavirus pandemics, the show starts right now with a series of online projects commissioned to artists artists, the first of which is The Obituary of the American Dream by Brooklyn-based artist Lisania Cruz. This is a beautiful project that encompasses several layers, the participatory, the memorial, the testimonial, the archival. The website kicked off a few days ago and is full steam online receiving contributions. We encourage you to participate and share your answer to the question, when and how did the American dream die for you? Hi, Lisanya, how are you? Estamos bien. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Thank um, you so much for joining us uh, tonight. Thanks, Elia and Susanna and everybody else uh, who's uh, watching was this uh, cloudy evening in New York and beyond. Uh, so perhaps you can start the conversation by asking you, Lisanya, this very question. When and how did the American dream die for you? Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Rodrigo, Elia, and Susana. And uh, thank you everyone who's joining um, and it's really exciting to be part of um, the triennial in El Museo, um, especially because of like the legacy of this institution. So to answer the question, I wanted to start by um, talking about where the American dream was born for me. Um, and I am from the Dominican Republic. Quisqueya, La Española, Santo Domingo, eh, however you want to call it. Um, and I think that um, for us in the DR, um, New York is sort of like a second home. Um, I had a family that was here. Um, everyone I knew had a cousin, an aunt, a grandma, someone in New York City. So this idea of like the you know, the American dream or coming to New York and making it um, was already ingrained in all of us. I mean, there's two million of us in the East Coast um, alone, and there's like around 11 million in the island. So this is me, um, my first time in New York City. This is me in the Rockefeller Center, and I was eight. And um, I was invigorated by the city and I wanted to come here uh, really bad to um, be a designer for the most part. So um, I guess when COVID hit, I was just like paralyzed. I couldn't even think. I was like, what is happening? And I basically sat in my couch um, reading for about, you know, two months, I would say March and April. And I was doing kind of like the things that give me life and was going back to sort of like artists and um, reading around scholarly reading, but also reading uh, political reading. And um, I was looking at Teixin Sien, um, performance, like one year performance around uh, the time clock and our value of time and work. And I was starting, um, I think since March, questioning what work meant and how we attach value to time based on like the, our productivity. And immediately I think I was like, I need to change this. This cannot happen because like, 
you know, my, my value cannot be ingrained in what I do in a year, but I wanted to think about how I lived a year. And then um, I was looking at Lydia Pape and, and thinking about uh, Divisor as a piece that really needed like a group of people to, um, to work and happen. And um, at around the same time, I was starting to read like the first chapter of Judith Butler on the force of nonviolence. And she's really uh, looking critically about individualism. And I was just trying to make sense of how individualism was ingrained in the American way of life and how, because capitalism had failed, um, individualism also was failing, you know? Like we're still today talking about people wearing masks um, and the idea that, you know, you, you don't need to wear a mask because nobody should tell you what to do. Um, and around that same time, I was the the first obituaries from Italy came, and it was like a fourteen pages of obituaries, and this shocked me um, because we I think still had not gone through like April, and um, I had family in Spain, so I was kind of like getting their news and you know, like in slow motion to where we were going to be in April. And to make things like more spicy, I guess, I got an email from the National Women's Liberation Group around a study group around universal programs and like the biases that we have um, around universal programs and started and had sort of, I mean, all of this, of course, was like a huge privilege that I could take time to read and, and pause, right? So um, in this group, it was a intergenerational group, but um, there were people that were part of the civil rights movement and um, the student organization. And I just learned so much from this woman because they had no um preconception of you know understanding their worth just by um what they need from the government and um it was an intense like three months of just doing a series of readings around healthcare, universal health care food stamps like the public programs like the public library and what does that mean um, even our city, you know, like the garbage collection, the post office. So this started to shift things in me. And I started to do sort of this um, weekly, uh, just kind of like working on like phrases that I was holding on to because literally reading and like this knowledge gathering and unlearning was the only thing that was keeping me a little bit sane. I mean, I was like literally like that cat. And, um, and just like looking at, you know, the essential was always treated as sacrificial. And this was a quote from Naomi Klein and how she was talking about the foundations of um, the United States. And just uh, so much of the world has been devastated by America. This idea that um, the ideals of America have proliferated around the world was something that I was thinking about. And this was from Arundhiti Roy. Um, and then I was reading around like history and Walter Benjamin and this idea of like history is a result of material conditions rather than ideals. Um, was something that I was starting to think about, you know, especially in time right now, thinking about 45 and like all the things that he was doing. Um, and then I was talking a lot with my grandmother because, you know, I, I felt like I wasn't talking to her enough. Um, and she was kind of amazed by the stories I was telling her and she was like Como que en Nueva York no hay recursos? like this was something that like this idea that in New York there was no resources for healthcare or like people needed to go to work still um, she couldn't understand it 
And this was like the moment I think that the American dream died for me um, after this conversation with her and um, understanding sort of like the way um, this view of America has changed. Um, so I started to be really critical about how those things live within myself um, and how do I embrace these ideas of individualism and, and, and kind of like ideals of hard work. Um, and also please intersect whenever you think you have a question or so. Um, I um, ask you, Lasanya. Yeah. I, maybe as you're talking to us about um, how you experienced the American dream died for you, can you talk a little bit about how that intersected with um, us, Elia, Rodrigo, and myself approaching you to be part of this um, virtual platform, this virtual project? Because I know I was following you and seeing you posting a lot of these different images and quotations. Um, and can you tell us about sort of the birth of the project itself? Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny because like, I think like the first, the second time we met, you were like, I keep seeing like, is this what you're going to propose? Um, and I think that I really had not, I, I've been thinking about these things, but have not made the connection. Um, and I think when we talked, um, we had talked before and then the pandemic happened um, and you guys were interested in what I was thinking through during the pandemic. Um, and I knew I wanted to, I mean, I, I, I have like trouble always pinpointing when ideas come to life. But I've been having, I was having conversations around, you know, like we, just like the way Americans don't think through about like this dissolution, this exceptionalism that Americans always have or feel. Um, and we don't have, like, I don't have that on like my government or the country. Um, and and not, not because I don't love my, country and I believe in it but just because like the government has failed so many people so often um, that it has prevailed through history that you cannot um, yeah like you, you don't depend on the government although we should depend on the government um, to do their job so we've been, I've been having conversations, you know, like even around the idea, Americans would need to get visas probably in the future. And for me, that's like really exciting because nobody knows what that process is. Nobody that's American understands the process that you have to get vaccines to get a visa, you know, to go to Germany. You have to show all your bank accounts. You have to like these processes that we go through, um, it's like out of the imaginary. So I think that for the first time through COVID, a lot of people were going through that process that were Americans. And then, you know, George Floyd happened. And I think like that also was put in like the gas pedals of like, okay, this is like in your face. Um, so I remember being in bed on a Sunday morning and sort of just like thinking through, I had to propose something and I knew I wanted to talk about this exceptionalism, individualism aspect. Um, and then all of a sudden I was like, I wanna kill the American dream or not kill it, but like I wanna show this moment of now we're all grieving and I wanted to grieve collectively this moment of, you know, dying through individualism and exceptionalism. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, I mean, I just want to add a couple of things on, on, on that, that we were, we've been working on this show for the last, um, more than a year, I would, I would say, in terms of its research. I remember we visited you in your studio in Brooklyn, maybe in October or something like this. Yeah, it was last, November, yeah. Yeah, maybe November of last year. 
and you were working on a project. I remember, you know, going through your walls and, you know, you were doing like this project with different uh, printmaking techniques and, right? So about the yeah. DR, you wanted to do something about the DR. And that, you know, as we were, you know, sort of composing the list and thinking about the show that was not really landing anywhere. But then when the, when COVID happened, I remember, you know, we had several conversations on whereby and Zoom, the three of us as curators. And then there was one day where, where we said, you know, we should really reach out to Lizania because she was doing a lot of work that is really about getting people together, you know, and uh, dealing with information and dealing with a lot of what I think it's needed, uh, we, we thought at this time, which is, you know, really occupying spaces where, you know, art can make a difference, not only in terms of aesthetic appreciation, but in terms of, you know, social practice, right, so to speak. So that's when we gave you a call. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I just wanted to say this uh, and also mention that if you open the chat box, I pasted the link to the platform. This is one of several uh, online artist projects that we are commissioning to start the exhibition now, opening in the galleries in the springtime, hopefully. And if you go to obitu obituariesoftheamericandream.com, uh, please drop your submission there. Yeah, that's what Yeah, I'm please doing. submit. Yes, exactly. I, 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 have a, I have a comment or something that I, uh, not a comment, actually a question for you. Yeah. Yeah, which is about the date 1931. And so you can talk a little bit about why you chose 19, I mean, we know because we discussed it. Um, because it's interesting um, when I posted this uh, conversation and your project online, I was getting a lot of DMs with people like, why is she starting with 1931? Like, and, you know, went into these discussions on, you know, you know, ideas of racism in the country have been beyond that. So the American dream was never even existent for yeah. groups of people. So I'd like for you to talk about why 1931? Yeah, I, maybe, let's see, because I... Oh, it's in there, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, this is what I talked about, the morning of the ideas, but this is why 1931. Um, uh, some people say the idea of the American dream started through the Great Gatsby, but actual historians coined the idea of the American dream to James Strissel Adams, and this book, the epic of uh, the epic of America. So the reason I, I mean, I knew that this was gonna be, you know, like a, a topic of conversation because um, yeah, with structural racism, like for many people, perhaps the American dream never existed in their imaginary, right? Um, but I wanted to make the reference to history um, which is also something that is important in my practice. Like, even if you remember um, the project I'm currently working on right now about the Dominican Republic, that is like um, this criminal investigation on the Dominican uh, racial imaginary. Um, I'm using a lot of historical points, references to kind of like pinpoint um, ideas that we currently have on our imaginary of race and and with that intersecting like the actual commentaries of of folks to to come and and do testimonies um so for me this idea of you know both oral history but also um written history is very important to use in both ways on like the projects i'm working on so historically um you know, all the references of the American dream go back to this book that was published in 1931. Of course, James Trussell Adams is a white immigrant, you know, so <laughs> it's like, it, of course it is that way. But um, I think that this is also important within the context of inviting people to participate and, and thinking through um, what is like the difference between 
the history that is told and the history that's published versus the, the oral history that's carried out through like people, through our families um, and through our own experiences. So I think that this is like a very important point. So thank you for that question. Yeah, and I think even, I mean, I can take an issue with, even with the term American dream, right? As Elia was saying, uh, as a cultural construction, you know, I mean, I even can take an issue with the term American. Yeah. Uh, as one country appropriating of a whole continent. Continent, yeah. <laughs> so I think that's highly problematic. You know, I don't say American to say someone is from the U.S. I say U.S. Yeah. person. Uh, but anyway, I think it's an interesting cultural construction, you know, that it has its implications. Uh, anyway, uh, just continue. You just wanted to share this. Yeah, again. no, for sure. Um, and, and talking about that American, I think there's like an interesting point too that we'll get through around this idea of nationality and, you know, like the constructions of nationality and who gets to pick those as well. Um, but yeah, this is just more of sort of like the readings and, and looking at this like dynamic as well, you know, I think these articles were within like a couple of weeks, but uh, Renika Ellen, who I actually just invited to participate and she, um, she will participate, um, she wrote this article and she has a book that it's called, it was all a dream. Um, so it's looking from, again, uh, a black and people of, and indigenous people of color, um, sort of like what was the American dream for them? So this was also a pivotal article as well as I, along as I was thinking of, of the idea. But also, you know, this article in the New York Times that was like the American dream is alive and well. Um, and it was like just talking about the different reasons why the American dream was alive and how inequality was not um, like actually a big issue that we need to focus on. But then you go into the comments and everyone is like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like this is not, even this comment that is from Germany, um, the, the, the person is saying how in Germany they're teaching how um, like the American dream and just like the kind of like the inequality has grown so prevalently in the United States. So I was, I, this also was an indicator to me that this was like a good time to have this conversation collectively again and, and kind of like invite people to share their stories. Um, so yeah, this to Elia's point, I think that one of all the things that I was thinking through and I've been thinking through a lot, this was like also, um, I thought of this one I was doing with the news was specifically this idea that, you know, citizenship in the US um, was constructed for a free white person. Um, so what does that mean and how it's constructed in the ideals of this country is like very important to um, think about when we're talking about these constructions and ideals. Um, and yeah, this is like the website and um, I think that it's, it'll be an online platform, but um, the idea is that we'll create a newsprint that uh, will be distributed next year as the show opens. And um, as with all my work, I'm always thinking about the public space and, and how to intervene both like the gallery space and the public space. Um, so I've been thinking through um, what would that mean with this newsprint uh, paper. Um, and please, you know, submit your stories. You get to, you could select if you want the story to be printed on the newsprint or if you don't, if you just want to be on the website. Um, but the more collective stories we have, the better the work gets. Um, 
So also bringing this point back on nationality because um, just today, one of the submissions um, raised this point and I loved how uh, Darius Polo um, just wrote about this because again, like an oversight of my part was to under or think that all nationalities will be included in like the default systems um, and algorithms that we use on the web. So we use the default form and what we had the oversight was to understand that of course, Puerto Rico is not a recognized nationality. And um, also this doesn't give an ability for people to have dual nationality. Some people, you know, are Americans, but also really much identify with um, the country of their parents or where they're born, et cetera. So um, I just wanted to raise this point because I think that again, to the point of these constructions of like cultural constructions and ideals, we, I, I always wanna be mindful that we're operating within this like, you know, grand system that um, is also a system that is not created for me, it's not created for um, people that have been marginalized. Um, and, you know, she said it better than anyone, the fact that Puerto Rico is not listed under nationalities for this project, especially one funded by El Museo, in an ironic way exemplifies the tragic illusion of the American dream for Puerto Ricans and Puerto Rican diaspora and the Puerto Rican diaspora. So I thank Therese and, um, for bringing that up and for reminding me that, again, algorithm is not necessarily inclusive. Um, I think, um, Lusania, this uh, systemic issue that was in this case exposed through Therese's testimonial, um, I think that's actually really where the beauty in your project lies because I wanted to mention how when we were talking to you, this was right at the same time after you shared your concept for this project, I think it was that weekend that we all saw the New York Times um, yeah. newsprint. And then you pointed out to me earlier today that this there was an Italian precedent even beforehand. But what's so I think poignant about your project is the shift from the individual to um, think about some of these underlying systemic issues. Uh, it's not just this particular disease, but all of the different systems that have contributed to what I see as like a total free fall right now. Um, so yeah, I absolutely. And I think that that's why, you know, COVID for me particularly, even though I understood and I've been um, kind of like learning a little bit more about the history underneath the foundations of this country um, and, and not only this country, but globally, um, I think that COVID just like put it on, you know, like put the spotlight on the system structures and, and not only COVID, I think 2020 is like, is kind of like the mega vision of, of um, it's like the year where if you didn't want to see, you were forced to see, you know, um, and you were forced to see in the news in like the streets in your everyday life. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, this is kind of like, um, it's, yeah, it's I, something that we're going through collectively and, and it's like a, a way of kind of like understanding how now it's the president. Yeah, I'm, I just wanted to share one comment about that also, which is, the fact that we're living under uh, authoritarian governments, both here and in Brazil, for instance, where I come from, where a lot of people, especially white people from like a bourgeois middle class environment, they are quite desperate uh, and say, you know, so God was not Brazilian, what's happening with us? And a lot of, you know, black and privileged people are saying, you know, this is welcome to my life. This is 
always been like that for us, right? So I think that's really this, what this year brings is really like the exposure to a level that was not known to a lot of people mm -hmm. or people pretend they were not aware of, right? So I think when yeah. you see like, there's really like this mounting of the public sphere of like healthcare, education, you know, all the things that you mentioned before, you know, that this, like, there's a big void, there's a free fall on, on those areas. People start to say, but what's happening with the, you know, my life, my life is over. But a lot of people are saying, you know, but mine never existed, never really existed, like, like you thought you had yours. So yeah. I mean, this is just, you know, that's just another comment of the same, you know, in a way narrative that this project, I think, uh, sort of uh, brings to light. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's, the system has failed so many people, but now it felt everyone, you know? Um, so I think that, um, and in a way, maybe that's not a good, that's not the right thing to say because like it has, it has failed like, it hasn't failed the elite and like the people in the 1% or in the mega, you know, positions of power. But I think that everyone, it's interesting. I was like listening again to like a lecture of Arundita Roy and she was, um, her and Naomi Klein are talking about the, I forget what the name is, like the green, the new, new green deal. And it's like around how we could think about climate change, but how we could think about um, poverty and, you know, issues of equality um, from the perspective of not nation-wise, but globally. Like we should move into a point where we are really thinking about um, the elites and then the rest of the world in a way. Um, and I'm, very interested in in like this way of thinking because i also think one thing that covid has made and back to your point of like these authoritarian um governments um people have become more nationalistic in a way and and kind of like the borders have been way more um secured and 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 we you know, I've always, I think at the beginning when I was like that, that, like that cat that I was like, just freaked out. I kept asking to myself, like, how are not, how aren't like governments working together? You know, like, it doesn't make sense that we are only concerned with the problem of the U.S. because eventually you know, people from here are going to travel to other countries or, and, and that's actually how the virus spread. So um, wh what is it that doesn't allow us to think globally yet? Um, and eventually climate change is going to come hit us and that's going to be a global issue. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very interested and that's why also I think I'm interested in this project so much because Again, this idea of the American dream, it's a global thing. Like it's, it's, not, only, um, it's not only a thing that um, has been, you know, um, idealized by Americans, but also by immigrants, like that they're coming to America to make it, um, like myself included, you know? And, and I think that this is why I'm interested in speaking about this and and sort of like collectively looking at ways that um we can move past this um so anyone if there's people anywhere please submit like the the project is open to <laughs> any person in the world um and now the form is like fill in so it's not a drop down so you could be like the the nationality, the nationality yes. field, right? That's yeah, important. exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's important because, yeah. So, I mean, this is super interesting. And I think, you know, multilateralism is really one of the things that authoritarian governments are attacking everywhere. 
because when we have people coming from different places, giving their perspective is much harder to actually control the masses. Which yeah, is exactly. What, which is what they are looking for. But I mean, just back to your project for a second, I'm curious about the image we have on the screen. Oh, <laughs> this is, so this is kind of like the, you know, and also the beauty of doing the work, the, the way I work too is, and, and I'm also grateful of like the curators I've worked with. Um, I wanted to point out that um, I don't want to stay in just kind of like the grieving and mourning uh, part of the project, but there's like a second phase of the project where um, I want to see how we could collectively write a new ideal or maybe it's not necessarily about writing a new ideal, but how can we understand what we need from government collectively? And I know that's also a conversation that's currently happening, but these are two reference points that I'm super interested in. Um, I'm a huge fan of Bayer Rustin's work and his life and legacy. Um, and when I was researching for this project in particular, I came across this um, this document that he did with Philip Randolph and it was a freedom budget for all Americans and it, um, it this was like right after the march and they wanted to provide work for everyone that could work and also provide um, benefits for people who actually couldn't um, work but how can we think about a budget that benefits everyone collectively um, and takes people out of like this completely economic inequality that we're living in today? Um, so that is something that is like in my research currently for the second phase, but also I was super interested in this design thought that happened in the 70s, um, Center for Brook uh, Architects. They basically designed the front of uh, Georgia, I believe. Um, it is like the, the river front and how they did it was through a televised uh, hackathon. So people would call and talk to an architect and say, what about if we did, a, you know, if we put benches there or we want to fish or, so the, the architects would draw the, will draw the design or the idea and um, everyone was watching on TV. So for me, this is kind of like an interesting approach as well of how the project could stay online and be accessible to everyone and how we could potentially write a collective ideal or think about the ways to- Awesome, that's awesome. Yeah. That's a wonderful, wonderful reference. And for those who just tuned in, please go to obituariesoftheamericandream.com and submit, send your proposal. Yes, we should have like news flash or like intermediate ad. <laughs> A link is in the chat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this this is um, sort of thinking the second phase, and then I also wanted to take the opportunity um, to share a little bit about how this project fits into my practice. And, you know, we've talked, I remember when you guys came to the studio, you were really interested in just how graphic my work is. And that is just because I'm trained as a graphic designer. And, um, you know, before I used to be very hesitant about saying I'm trained as a graphic designer in the art world, but I'm starting to get warm up into the idea that this is kind of like part of my practice and, and I use very much a lot of like the, the strategies of graphic design and branding to think about work and, and, and projects in particular. And how I've come to terms is that I was invited to a talk, like I think it was last year, I can't remember, 
um, and it was like around um, uh, working in the in between. And I love, um, I I love kind of like the way this talk was curated because um, I do think that I work very much in these like in between spaces. Um, and I guess like in between, you know, design and art, um, where I'm using typography, I'm using print, um, as like tools for my work and the, in between like this idea of like the audience as ex an expectator, but also a co-creator of the work, you know, like people are sharing their stories, um, in between this aspect of like the object is actually an archive of like the experiences um, for the most part, um, looking at how I could occupy space in like the gallery and the institution, but also in public space and thinking through of like one narrative versus like a pluralistic narrative. Um, and yeah, like the, I think the work that got me into the sort of vein of work that I'm doing now was actually a graphic design project. And this was a project I did, I think like seven, seven years ago. Um, and it was with an organization called Vocal NYC. And they were the ones who just um, organized Occupy City Hall. And they also were a very, uh, key to passing the Fair Chance Act, which is better known as Ban the Box, and is the it's kind of like the law that people that have been um, involved in the criminal justice system, when they're looking for a job, they have the right to not talk about their record until they get the job offered. So this project was very participatory in nature because um, the client was, you know, 10 people that were gonna use this information um, and, and 10 people that um, were in the process of being interviewed for jobs. And it was with the Center for Urban Pedagogy. And this is kind of like the moment where I was like, okay, I want to stop working in fashion and kind of work um, in more in tandem with organizations that are working in social justice. Um, so I just put this here as like a, a reference to that work. Yeah. Um, so but, I, I know that we also have the go to um, share a little bit about like like previous works right mm -hmm. so maybe if you want to start that we have uh I, I would encourage our uh participants tonight also to send questions on the chat box if they want i'm happy to to read them and uh, as we progress our conversation here tonight yeah yeah so i was gonna start sharing some of Kind of previous work which started from the impetus of you know what would it look like for us to create our own muse um, and this was a project that i started in 2017 and it's called we the news and i um collaborated with an organization that's called the black alliance for just immigration and we organized a series of story circles um, and it was inviting black immigrants and first generation black Americans to talk about the intersection of blackness and migration, but also um, moving away from this like monolithic of blackness in, in, in the US. Um, and the, I recorded, transcribed and edited the, the stories uh, in collaboration with the participants. Um, and then I created a series of zines. And so far we have 19 scenes. Um, and these are all told from like the first perspective of the, the participants. And then I created this newsstand that is like a traveling newsstand that I put on the sidewalk and 
typically I invite musicians um, or there's other artists that are hosting workshops, um, but it's really about how can we reclaim the public space with these narratives. Um, and again, too, I've been fortunate enough to be invited to put the newsstand in a gallery space, um, but also always trying to think of how I activate both the white cube and outside. Um, and the image to the right, I think to the right or left, <laughs> the right, it's, um, it's outside untitled in Miami. Um, and it was interesting because I, you know, it was like an interesting conversation when you're collaborating with an art fair and then I, I was like, I wanna be outside. I, there's like, this is, you know, people pay $30 to come into this uh, fair. And it was um, a great opportunity as well to be able to activate the, the sidewalk at Ocean Drive. Um, and I collaborated with Michael Jurinsky, um, who's an architect, and basically everything falls into kind of like a, a box that opens up into the newsstand. Um, and this was uh, just last September, and it was a couple of blocks from my house, and this is Restoration Plaza, a very important place in bed -Stuy historically and um, again in this in this happening and particularly uh, was when there was a campaign around no new jails and um, the conversation around closing Rikers and the mayor wanted one of the program or like the the idea was like okay let's close Rikers but let's make six more jails um, which doesn't make any sense really. <laughs> and so what we did was that we asked people what they would do um, with the $11 billion that would cost to make these new jails. And it's sort of, this was, I think a week before the vote um, on making the new jails or not. And unfortunately um, it didn't pass like, or it did pass and they're moving along the plan, um, hopefully not. But um, this was also to incentivize people to understand what was happening and kind of call their representatives and say that they were not agreeing with the budget. Um, and at the same time, I invited one of the participants to read her story and we did a panel around the importance of archiving our own stories and um, yeah, using publishing and archiving material to preserve our own history. And similarly, so if you guys have any questions and we then use. <laughs> um, and the last project I wanted to share um, was a project I did as a recess residency um, session last year. And I, again, I'm interested in talking about like the connection of our, you know, like our home countries and um, the places that we live now and economically how these things are also connected. So um, last year, $500 billion were sent to remittances, which is, you know, remesas, the money that migrants send home. And, um, you know, unfortunately with COVID, they're saying that they're estimated that these would um, be 20% less this year, which is a big, a huge impact. So um, the project, it was, it was, it had different stations of participation and but the main idea of the project was that i invited folks to anyone that came into the gallery to leave a receipt um from one to 200 the project is called 200 from two with love 200 is the amount of money that um it's like the most common remittance amount monthly 
So, you know, people could say I spend $4 on my coffee and you would just um, put it in this receive uh, pocket thing and write your name and what you spend that money, that amount of money on. Um, and then you will chart it in the wall. And then with those receipts, um, I worked with a friend, a good friend of mine who is an economist, Agustin Indaco, and um, he helped me um, create sort of like a, you know, like a spreadsheet of what the dollar, what one dollar could buy in one of the food items um, in one of the 15 countries that receives more remittances. So for instance, um, you know, um, this one that is like the plantains, uh, that's 35.73 kilos of plantains in the DR for a $29 uh, purchase of cat food. Um, so when people would come back into the gallery, they would see and sort of like understand the value of the dollar and and what that in, what the impact of remittances does um when you send that money home and i think that, that project is such a beautiful in a way um i mean all of your work we can draw sort of how you work uh, across your projects and how some of similar themes um and approaches we see throughout um i wanted to ask you with remittances we really see the interconnections between um, countries from local communities to um, transnational across transnational borders um, and I wonder if you wanted to connect that back to the fact that our platform or your platform I should say obituaries um, instead of working directly with a particular community it's so open and it really allows for this very international um, audience to be able to participate um, and how you see maybe this international platform potentially is that different for your work I I mean I think I, I I've been you know I've worked in the past where I worked with very specific like one community um, and I see that I'm moving towards like understanding these issues in like a larger scale. Um, for instance, I've been thinking about a project in New Orleans in relationship to Katrina, um, but can understanding like, can we think about migration from state to state um, and displacement from state to state? Um, and I think that that's the beauty of like an online platform um that it could be accessed from anywhere and you know hopefully we've also added capabilities that um people it could be read in any language um and other accessibilities capabilities but i'm i'm really interested in in just like you know because like these issues could be drawn back to other countries as well um for instance with remittances Something I was just um, listening to a podcast from The Economist, and they were talking around the oil industry and how so many Egyptians um, are, you know, sent remittances that work in the oil industry in the Middle East. Um, and it's like a, was around two million people that were not sending remittances back to Egypt. So you know, these ideas, again, are, you could draw back to any place in the world. Um, they're yeah, they're interconnected in a way. Yeah. I, I think this is really beautiful, this idea of like this global connections around migration, around immigration, right? I remember going to Cabo Verde, Cape Verde, a number of years ago and uh, driving through a whole neighborhood uh, full of nice houses of people who actually didn't live there. They live here in Florida and in, also in Portugal. And so they built those houses for their families yeah. uh, with the money they were making here. And there was, you know, the, the economic impact was not necessarily on the place where the wealth was created. And in this way, in a, 
in a quite beautiful way, you know, in this case, in a quite beautiful way, but the same, you know, the same goes for, you know, in economy where you have, yeah. like in mining, for instance, is a big problem because it generates a lot of wealth, not where it's done, but it's elsewhere, right? In the main centers of the world. But yeah. I'm, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt a little bit because no, go ahead. we are uh, hoping to hear from you guys on the chat box if you have questions. Otherwise, we should be coming to an end, right? Yeah. I'm I asking, think... uh, Susanna, can you help me? Well, I think, Lasanya, I know you had a, um, a nice way, I think, that you wanted to end with one more uh, piece from this particular show that you had. Yeah. Or... Um, Don't mind skipping ahead. Oh, that, there's oh. actually, there's a cool question here on the chat box to you. Uh, can Lasanya talk about her connection to Miami? I don't know if it's how you... I don't have any connection to Miami. Like, <laughs> I... Um, in, in a way, all my family, all the people that migrated to the United States um, came to New York. And, you know, like the connections I had with Miami were sort of like this idea of people that, I don't know, Miami has like a, a weird sense in my imaginary that it was always like middle class or like, you know, the, <laughs> the people who could afford to travel to shop in a way um so i but le lately i've been um building connections in miami now as an artist which is like there's a beautiful community of artists there um and the Cajun cultural center um they put the newsstands a couple of times out and um so there's there's sort of like, now I've sort of created more connections than I guess like familiar connections. Yeah, also through this uh, couple of times you exhibited there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, There's one more question. Hi. Hey. Uh, that Lusania, your title to some degree assumes a death, um, even when people might not be aware that something is dead. And so the question is about how you came to the title. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think I was interested in, again, maybe this talks about systems. I was like already thinking about the ways that I was gonna display this um, information. Um, and I was, again, very, um, I was thinking of like the format of the obituary um, and, and how we use obituaries to remember, to write, um, but also how obituaries take place in, in newsprint um, and also in like a collective grieving. So I do think that I do wanna question people. Um, maybe they don't think that the American dream has died for them, um, but maybe within the question, there is like the idea to look back and kind of like understand the structural systems that are affecting them. Um, and I think that, you know, when I was doing, when I was doing this National Women Liberation Study Group, they have a, a feminist technique that is around consciousness wearing, uh, consciousness racing, consciousness racing. And it's basically all these conversations are started with a question. Um, and one of the one of the first questions was around food stamps and have you used food stamps and why not? And um, I've never thought about like, why have I not used food stamps? Um, and, and the implications that that statement suggests on like, you know, my privilege, um, but also on kind of, again, these ideals that uh, food stamps are for a certain type of person and, and how how am I being complicit already from kind of not questioning these things in myself? So 
I think that is important always to raise the question um, as if, you know, this, this thing is dead. Um, it's been dead, you know, as Elia was saying, there's people that have never thought it was actually alive. A thing. Uh, <laughs> that was a thing. That it was a thing. So, um, so how are you not thinking that it's dead, you know? So, so here's another question. Um, do you, we're talking about it's a thing or not. Do you think the American dream, there could exist a revival of this American dream? Resurrection. A resurrection. That question is the, you know, I'm, I don't want to say this, but that question is the same question as reform. Um, whereas like, can we reform the system? Um, I personally, and this is my opinion, I think it's very difficult to reform, reform something that foundationally is so wrong. Um, so for me, that's why I'm interested in not reviving it, but actually thinking, reimagining something new. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. I think that's maybe finally the perfect transition to the <laughs> way the perfect transition. Yeah. Um, so please submit your please submit <laughs> obituary PR campaign. <laughs> Write something. Yes. Um, think about it. You know, I've I've had friends that have shared the site and they're like I've never thought about this. I have to think about it. So there's time to think about it. Talk with people. My email is on the website. So I'm, I'm open to questions as well. And, and it's kind of like a channel for conversation. Um, so, yeah. So I think with that is a, is a, it's a, a great place to to, to come to an end of our session tonight. And I would love to thank you so much, Lizania, for your time and your thought, not only tonight in the presentation, which was really, really wonderful, uh, but also doing this work with us. It really is a really, really powerful way to start this show, as I said in the beginning. The show starts now. I think this is really important to, you know, yeah, to think of exhibitions in a less uh, concentrational, you know, like yeah. in a concentrated way in a more, so in this time we were forced to do so, but I guess this is, this is good. And on that note, I also want to ask you, all to stay tuned with El Museo and to Casa. That's our um, home delivery initiative. That is the result of the hard work of not only the curatorial team, but the whole El Museo team. So, I mean, I just want to give a shout out to everyone who's involved in these programs at this time, public programs, communication, the whole institution. Uh, but also in with Latria now, we'll continue to keep you informed about the new uh, art, uh, uh, online artist projects, right? So Poncelic Creacion, the collective based in San Juan in Puerto Rico, they are the next uh, program uh, and we'll soon uh, uh, send more details about that, right? So, and next we have uh, Collective Magpie, uh, Shime is Izquierdo Ugas and Michael Manchaka. These are the other three artists that will continue to create and present work uh, uh, on our digital uh, platforms and the in the online artist projects. So thank you so much, Susanna and Elliot. Thank you so much, Lizania. Thank you. Thank you, Yay. Thank thank you everyone, everyone for joining, and uh, you all have. Yes, thank uh, you all for joining. Wonderful night. That was that was really a great beginning. Really bye good. bye. Gracias. Bye. Gracias.